What's going on, everyone? And welcome to another episode of The Only Cannoli Show. Today, we had Evan Harden. He is a Cal Sense professional and teacher based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He had taught me so much in this conversation about having grit, perseverance, and doing the things that you promise yourself to do to be the best version of yourself. Stay tuned. Here it is. So, Evan, what are you passionate about? I'm passionate about giving back. How do you do that? Uh, whatever, whatever I've learned, whatever knowledge or wisdom I've gained over in overcoming challenges that were thrown my way and then helping other people overcome theirs. That that's that's how I do it in, in my in my best to my best ability. Yeah. So what kind of experiences have you been through in your life that kind of gave you this like experience, like life experience, like help people around you or kind of give advice to others around you? I experienced a lot of, you know, you know health issues within the family. Uh, I experienced overcoming injuries personally and in, you know, a lot of different things in, that happen naturally in life, like death uh, mm-hmm. and just overcoming those different obstacles and, and challenges personally put you through a, a lot mentally. Mm-hmm. And once you get over that, you learn what it takes. So you're able to pass that on to somebody else going through it to, yeah. to make their way a little easier. No, of course. And do you think that it's harder to go through, like you said, like health and stuff, like the physical pains and the physical struggles or like those mental and emotional struggles? Mental. M- m- mental's tougher. Yeah, I would, I would straight go to <laughs> mental. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I think especially when it comes to like mental acuity and like being like battling yourself is such a different thing from like battling an outside source, like an external source where it's like, oh, I have an ailment or I'm sick. It's like, okay, it's me versus this disease or me versus this pain or me versus this external thing that's happening in life. But when it's you versus you, it's like you're your own worst enemy, but also you're the only one that can save you. So I can see how like maybe mental is something that most people think is overlooked, but is a very difficult challenge. You said you, you said it very well right there. Yeah. <laughs> what are some strategies that you use to like kind of mentally adapt or mentally beat that like tough feeling within oneself? I mean, sticking to my passion. I, I mean, I always start, first start off with you know I, I'm very spiritual. I pray, I meditate, uh, and and you know staying healthy, staying active, keep stay moving. Mm-hmm. Stay moving is very important to me. Uh, so, you know, once, once you become stagnant, you start letting those, those thoughts that are overcoming you really, really take root. So it's important to keep moving, keeping your mind active, uh, stay, move with purpose and intent, Mm -hmm. I would say. And then, and then for me, always educating yourself. So reading, reading books, uh, taking new classes because it, it gives you new information on how to tackle old problems. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, of course. So that's uh, I would say those are those are the ways I I took to overcoming the challenges. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I remember when I first studied abroad in England, I had a friend gave me this advice, and you know, it's overthinking all the thoughts that are passing and rushing through your head when you're kind of not a hundred percent or feeling yourself. He said, at the end of the day, you just got to keep busy. And when you keep busy and you're doing things, then you have time to. Oh, uh, I, I'm thinking about this problem or this problem or this emotional issue or oh, this person left me or oh, I have to break this friendship off or oh, I have to do this off. I have to do this, but then you stay active, you stay busy, then you don't have time to be sitting there overthinking about things that you don't need to be overthinking about. Mm-hmm. And it kind of like resonated with me where it's like the more I stayed active, the more I did all those things, and the more opportunity came for me. But also, I had to think about something else because I'm doing something else. Uh, your focus is is different. Mm-hmm. What your focus, your attention is different, and it helps you step away. And then by the time you really look back at those problems, you, you most likely have outgrown it. So the problem looks smaller. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's an interesting concept. I know that um, when I first met you, obviously, we were on like, networking events in Philadelphia. And when we first like met and we were interacting and everything, you were telling me about all about like, calisthenics. And I would love to like learn a little bit about kind of what got you passionate about doing that and like what kind of was your main focus into being even like a calisthenics teacher as well. Oh, man, that's, that's a long journey. So I would say about 13 years ago, if if we going like really dive into why I did it, I would say because I needed a change in 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 my life, and I came across calisthenics by seeing somebody do something on YouTube, and I saw somebody else doing something in the gym, and we always honestly we we misjudged it, and I was calling it goofy. I was like, "What's this dude doing hanging upside down?" And as I as I more things came across me, I started doing more research. I was already a trainer and an athlete, so I had understanding of how, you know, certain mechanics work. And then once I started doing my digging, once I started doing research, I really wanted to take a whole new approach to how I even train myself. 
So I stopped lifting weights and I started uh, methodically approaching calisthenics, working on basics, mastering steps. And over time, it really helped me overcome a lot of injuries I was dealing with. And I saw myself getting a lot stronger. And then I started seeing a lot of the other guys that were doing it, how strong they were. Mm-hmm. And it motivated me to want to keep going. So I would say once I started doing that and started really getting involved in the community and starting to see how it helped not just me but other people, it pushed me to want to help give that gift to other people. Mm-hmm. And I would say that that was the beginning of me really wanting to teach and give back through the vigorous training I put myself through to understand how it works and to be able to give the gems to other people mm-hmm. so they can see how it works for them too. Yeah. And do you kind of go around Philly, like, do you build gyms? Do you kind of help build community gyms? Or you just kind of have, like, one gym that you tend to, like, teach and work out of? Well, the, the purpose of calisthenics, honestly, is you can do it anywhere mm-hmm. and stay in shape. You can do it, any, you do it anywhere and take care of yourself. You don't need to search for, you know, weights or a gym to really stay in shape. And But one of the other things I saw is when there were outdoor fitness parks in different areas, it built a real sense of community around them, people gathered and worked out together and there was no pressure it was just outside you were hanging out and I wanted that for Philadelphia so I was able to help get one built in South Philly and it's part of my mission to drive to get more built in South Philly Mm. Uh, not an easy task but definitely something I want to do and help people understand what they're for Mm -hmm. so by making it popular and teaching and doing all these different things people start to understand what the parks are for people start to build community around them You know, the community grows, people get more involved and, you know, each one teach one that helps everybody else out. So that's that's how I became passionate about it. And you said it's been 13 years since you really locked into calisthenics? Yeah, yeah. it's been quite some time. What's like the most difficult part of the calisthenics journey? Like obviously, like as me as well, like I've been an athlete, I've obviously lifted and stuff. And I know obviously pull ups, sit ups, all the different athletes. And like you said, power cleaning versus deadlifting versus all these explosive movements versus the simple power building movements. So what about calisthenics was the hard part, I guess, when like you step into it or like with the journey doing it as well? Um, Personally, for me, it'd be the consistency. Mm -hmm. And then always, I mean, testing yourself come with it. You kind of have fun with it, but you got to stay consistent. And even when you don't see major progress all the time, you know, it comes. And it comes for everybody differently, so you you can't uh, get discouraged. So I would say it would be the, being, staying consistent, building that discipline and that habit of, of marching. You know yeah. what I mean? No, of course. And it's interesting because even for me, like, when I, like, started, like, lifting and, like, trying to get stronger and stuff, even post-soccer, during soccer, I always realized that when I got, like, stronger, like, even like felt better about myself is when I was kind of doing more body weight movements. And one of my friends was like, dude, you really want to get bigger arms or bigger this, bigger that's like, dude, just do some weighted dips, do just weighted pull-ups, like do use your body weight to like your advantage. And I was always thinking like, it's interesting that people think that we need, Oh, you have to bench, you have this, you have that to get big arms or big chest. But like you said, clearly with calisthenics, people don't lift them any weights physically or anything, but still get big arms, big chest and are strong. So what's, do you know any like kind of like the science behind that as to why that happens? I mean, people train differently. Uh, you know, you can do supersets. You can you can just do different things. Um, for me, I don't I don't think about uh, like big big chests or big arms. It, it's not about that. Mm-hmm. It's about being more functional. It's about moving better. It's about being more athletic. Um, there's very little. There's there's not always advantageous to have big arms and muscles. Yeah. You know, it's different sports. It's different things. You know, if you're if you're on a swim team, it's not going to be advantageous to be the one with the biggest muscles and mm-hmm. chest. You know what I mean? That. So, I don't necess- I don't think that way. I think who's more functional. Mm-hmm. You can bench press, but can you can you pull yourself up? You know, though it doesn't equate to me. You know, big muscles don't equate to athleticism, to functionality, mm-hmm. to flexibility. You can put those things together if that's how you choose to train, but that's not the intent. That's not the that's not the purpose mm-hmm. and how I'm teaching people how to gain a higher level of strength and, and wellness and fitness. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. No, of course. What's like a sample, I guess, like standard workout, for example, for like a day-to-day workout that someone would do or that you would recommend someone? I mean, you can keep it simple. Push-ups, build your way up, 
maybe if you can't do any, start with 20 a day, every day for a couple weeks, then 30, then 40, so you can get to doing 100 a day. That'll change you. Just that alone, on a daily basis, you'll you'll see a dramatic change if you do that every day and keep up with it. <laughs> Just that little habit. If you want to even take it further, pull-ups. If you can't do pull-ups, Leg raises. I, I mean, you can just really stick with push-ups. Mm-hmm. You can even get that simple. I recommend a lot of my clients to just do just push-ups a lot of times. Even kneeling push-ups, those count if you do them correctly. You know, and I, I teach a lot of people start to start there. I started there. I started with even more basic level push-ups just to master that and see how it feels, see how it works. So if you're looking for something extra simple outside of anything you can YouTube, I would say you know, you can just do push-ups and yeah. keep record and slowly build up. No, that's awesome. And it's interesting because, like, it's such a basic exercise to us. Like, oh, push-ups, of course, right? Like, I remember being in elementary school or middle school, you're doing those fitness tests. You do, like, the pacer test and you do the push-up test. You do the flexibility test and all these little tests. But the push-up test is always there. So it's interesting that it's such a staple thing we tend to, like, overlook maybe sometimes. Yeah, for sure. I don't think it's been taught properly mm-hmm. to the people, you know. But, yeah, it can be that simple. It makes sense. And when you do calisthenics, do you also kind of add like your own cardio to it or is it more like sprint workouts? Do you do like long distance or mileage or is the calisthenics process also cardiovascular building? Again, that'll come into how you dip- how you want to train. You could do burpees. Mm-hmm. That, a lot of them. I do a lot of them. That's cardiovascular. I run. I jump rope. All those things are within a range of calisthenic movement because you're moving with your own body. Mm-hmm. Not always strength conditioning wise, but again, I jump rope to... I do a lot of different things. I don't think I uh, box calisthenics in with, oh, this can build cardio. I mean, it's strength conditioning. You can use it, but I think nothing will replace just running and yeah. jumping rope and doing active, moving things that make your heart speed up. No, it's awesome. And kind of just obviously when we like initially met and everything, we were networking and going to different events. Like, What kind of inspires you to like be in this community and what kind of still pushes you and drives you to like do competitions? So. I mean, as I got deeper into the community, you see there's a different level of training and what can be done when you do calisthenics beyond push-ups and pull-ups. You got people who do tricks very like similar to gymnastics, mm-hmm. but can gain that same level of strength outside on a pull-up bar. Mm-hmm. And over the years, I've seen a lot of different, they have a lot of different competitions, a lot of organizations throwing competitions around the world, and I wanted to be a part of that. So I was throwing competitions out here in Philadelphia because there wasn't really a scene. There wasn't really... There wasn't a community like that. There might have been a couple people here and there that were doing some things, but there wasn't a big community across the board where people could be like, oh, this is going on out here. This is where we can do it at. And that's what I wanted to create out here. So that's how the competition, I started throwing competitions. I was already throwing events. So just doing a fitness event wasn't really a big crossover. Mm -hmm. So. So, yeah, that's how I got into doing that. So I've been doing that for a few years. Met a lot of the athletes. They come, they came down, competed for me. Prizes, really dope competitions all over the city. So it's been really cool. And that's like you said, like the community aspect was like awesome to like bring people together and actually do these types of things, which is probably really entertaining. But also, like like you said, like when you give back, it's like a feel-good experience. Correct. Yeah. And that's awesome. And it was interesting because I was thinking about how – Nowadays, we don't have like third spaces and like a third space is basically like where you go besides work and home, work and home. But then there's that third place, that fourth place where you go and you hang out, you go to a library, you go here, you go there. But it's like nowadays we've kind of eliminated that and it's become our phones. And because our phones are the next, the third place we go to now, being outside and like you said, community building and how important that is. And what have you noticed in like the last couple of years of your life noticing do people less and less like go to these third spaces as like for example like the community building or do people just end up staying behind their cell phones and their devices considering what i do that's not something i really focus on mm-hmm. i see people do a lot of different things whether it's go to a cafe or go to a bar or go out running mm-hmm. the gym a lot of those spaces the gym you know how they interact on their phone what we doing making content you working whatever you doing so I can't say that for sure. All I know is when you're a part of your day, if I can show you why you can include this as a part of your community, a part of your lifestyle, and it make a positive impact in addition to whatever you do, then I feel like I did my part. Mm-hmm. So how you spend your time, I mean, that's how you spend your time. That's yeah. always going to be up to the individual. I can't force 
anybody to do anything, and I wouldn't do what you're interested in. If you interested in what watching whatever's on that phone, then that's what you're interested in. If it, and I just hope whatever you're doing value to you yeah so that's all i really can say on that no of course like, it makes sense too where it's like you can use the phone either for distracting wasting time or learning a bunch of skills and like you said you were watching youtube to see different calisthenic movements yeah. so it's like what you spend your time doing is the important part rather than just the actual device right and i know that you were saying that you're really passionate about like developing oneself so let's say someone was in a rut and they were kind of feeling real down about themselves what would you be like your three-step process to like, getting someone out of a rut like if you had to give advice for it. I mean, it depends on the rut. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ruts. It can be a big rut. It can be a little one. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said first, it just is move and read. I don't I I have no idea what's going on. To be move and read. Stay active, keep your mind moving and read so you can find some sort of new information that can help you with this old problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that would be then apply, then stay strong. Maybe pray. Yeah. That'd be three steps and pray. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And it's cool because even for me, like as someone who's also very spiritual as well, like in the times that I found that I was really struggling or kind of didn't have like my mind right and felt wild, basically, you know, just putting your head to the floor, talking to God and being like, yo, like, I need some help here. You know, like mm -hmm. help me out, show me the way, you know, it's then you start noticing things happen in life. You start picking up random signs, random connections. Someone will say something that you needed to hear and like, how did this person know I needed to know that? Right. Mm -hmm. But those little signs, like don't ignore them. I think for me, like, that's something that's always helped is, like, when you have, like, that sense of spirituality or prayer in your life, you have something look back on that holds you together rather than just my ego that holds me together. Mm -hmm. So I love that. What's something that you've done to kind of, like, like, what are the ways that you kind of feel, like, about that spiritual sense? And how did you become more spiritual as an individual? Uh, how did I become more spiritual? I feel like that's that's always a loaded question, you know, because uh, I think most of us started off religious. For For me... Re, re, being in like growing up in a Catholic church, how how it was taught to me didn't always make sense as a child, and that kind of stuck with me that it didn't make sense. Um, but I guess in my hardest hardest times, it it also served as a foundation to how like finding my way to God. Mm -hmm. I don't think I stuck directly to the Catholic script. Mm -hmm. So I became more open-minded to a lot of other thoughts, thoughts out there, whether it be even Buddhism or Islam. And then just finding my own way personally and what, and what felt right to me. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what I really came to, what is what felt right to me. And through that, I, like you said, the signs and the, I feel like a lot of answers unfolded and, and revealed themselves to me. Mm -hmm. And then when I stayed open, when I didn't judge, when I stayed open-minded, when I was open to more things, I felt like I was able to see more that mm -hmm. connected with me. And that's how I feel like I, I developed my spiritual connection to God. No, I love that. And it's interesting because even when it comes to like open-mindedness, I always tell people like, that's like the cheat code of life. Like when you're open-minded, you are allowing yourself to listen and learn things that might not be what you were growing up doing right you might mm -hmm. be like oh wow why does someone do this in their life why does someone do this but then people tend to just shut out everything they don't know and just focus on what they've already known right but then how can you grow if you're not allowing new ideas to kind of encompass your own individuality where right. it's you kind of learn and adapt and you're like oh snap like what about this and this and this and then as you're learning all these new things you take the things that you like out of everything that you're learning and you apply it to your own personal life. Mm -hmm. But it's like, that's kind of what you're supposed to do. But t people tend to think like, oh, like, how do I do that? How do I start? You know, so it's, I, I kind of love how you've kind of done that naturally throughout, like, you're using your life and you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to improve myself as Evan. Mm -hmm. What other, like, when you kind of went through that journey, what were some things that you thought were like, you couldn't believe it, this is how simple the answer was or this is how, oh, snap, like, this happened. Like, how did I not see this sooner? I don't think I approached anything like that when it came to, it could be a eureka moment that you may be speaking on, or it can be even just finding out new information. Either either way that that information came to you when it came to you. Mm -hmm. and Or maybe you knew it and you had a eureka moment, but at the time that you had the information, you had no use for it, mm -hmm. even personally. You know, you can... Know that a wrench can be an important tool, but if you have nothing to use it for and you're not a mechanic, you know, it's just a, it's not useful to you. Yeah. Somebody may show you how to use it, but 
is still not useful to you. But then you get older and you get into a situation, oh, a wrench, I know how to use it. That information is useful to you in that moment. So I don't think anything was like, oh, it's so simple. Either I was prepared and that preparation came with, you know, some sacrifices from other time because I was pre- doing something to be prepared or I learned. And I don't, yeah, I don't think I was like, dang, I mean, you play games and stuff, but if you're talking real life, you probably, or you knew better and you didn't do better, mm-hmm. so, but then you still learn. So it didn't really come easy. So no, nah, I don't, I don't really feel like there was anything that really was like, oh, I knew this unless it was a mistake. Yeah. But yeah. No, I kind of like that actually, because it kind of shows where it's like where you are right now is where you need to be. Mm-hmm. And there's no sense of like, oh, like if only I would have done this. Oh, if only I knew sooner. But it's like, no, you didn't know sooner. So that's OK. You know now mm-hmm. and just act on what you can't control in the moment going forward. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like how you kind of brought it back to that because it kind of shows like that growth mindset and that open mindedness to be like, OK, F it. I messed up. Who cares? Now, it's, how can I do the next thing to not mess up? Yeah. Right, right. Can- That's pretty cool, though, because um, I was recently uh, talking to someone and I was explaining to them, like, me, like, I was born Muslim and everything, and I had Islam in my life the same way you maybe grew up with Catholicism in your life. And I tell people, like, but when I got older, you had to, like, become a Muslim. You had to fall in love with it, understand it as an adult, versus you're just taught this and then, okay, I do this, why? And when you start asking that question, why, 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 I tell people all the time, like, I think for me, I got spiritual first. And understood like the spirituality of life and how I emotionally felt about things mm-hmm. and then related it back to like my religious faith and the backgrounds and the teachings. And once I noticed them kind of coincide with one another and it was like harmonious, then I was like, oh, nice. But that's why I tell people all the time, like spirituality, like people say ground, right? Put your feet in the ground and get sunlight and do all these different things. Make sure before you drink your water, say positive things to it or positive affirmations. People talk about these kinds of things. But then before you drink water and like in Islamic culture and or what we learn, you say Bismillah, which is like in the name of God. Or like before you drink water, it's like blessing your food before you, pr- you pray to eat. And all those little things is like show- showing us like how science kind of backs up the religious to the values of spirituality. So it shows kind of like this world is so connected. But we kind of don't see it that way until you see it that way. You know, so I think it's pretty awesome that you kind of also related it to that spirituality sense as well. When you find what's true to you, I feel like that's what it is. But work for you would make would feel right, would make you feel good, what makes you, you know, if it don't tear you down and build you up, then... That's what that's what's for you. That's awesome. So, what's something in life that you've done that you're proud that you've accomplished? I mean, man, it can be a lot of things. It can be I, I made it. I made it here to to this podcast. To, you know, throughout my entire life, that that led me to making it here today. Mm-hmm. Uh, graduate graduating high school was probably more important than it felt more important than graduating college. Why is that? I don't know. It. I feel like when I went to college, it. it Outside of when people told you you needed it to get a good job, outside of the fact that I love to learn, I just didn't feel a need for that. Wasn't interested in it. I got there and it just didn't spark any interest. Like outside, I gotta do it, you know. And it, and it's not to say like I'm not going to do things that I have to do that I know I need to do because it's and I don't avoid it because it's hard. It's just that's not. I can go learn stuff. I take classes. That that just wasn't it for me. Mm-hmm. Um. High school was important. I wanted to, you know, make sure you did that. You know, that, that I, that's just how I felt. Mm-hmm. And even looking back, it just, that's what I'm more fond of. I can say accomplishing, doing those things, becoming a calisthenic athlete, competing. That was cool. That's, that's a proud moment of mine, being in the field and, and doing that and going from not being able to do too much of anything, even a pull up, to actually competing and doing tricks and stuff. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. You were also telling me that like, you biked Baltimore Pike. Can you explain a little bit about that? So when I wanted to start building my brand in calisthenics, but just build my brand in general so people knew who I was. So people, when I was talking about calisthenics, it wouldn't just be like some random person. I live in Media PA, which is a little far, a little bit further than Spring Garden. <laughs> I mean, Springfield Mall, excuse me how I, I used to throw the boot camps at the art museum. So this was, I did it every Saturday. This was in all weather. I did the boot camp, I, all weather. I ride my bike from Media PA all the way down Baltimore and up all the hills, all the way to the art museum. Oh. Uh, I throw the boot camp. I do the workout with, with the people. Then I rode my bike back. Um, that was, that's, that was my mission. That was the hike I was on. Uh, yeah, that's the OG trail right there. I don't think 
I don't think anybody else ever did that. Yeah. How many miles was it? I don't know. You got to Google that. <laughs> you got to Google that. It was, it's, I don't think it seemed as far, as, it, it seemed further than it, than it was probably, but it's a tough ride. Mm-hmm. It's a tough ride. So you're saying there's like a lot of hills and stuff and a biking of, up hills is something. Yeah. You drive, you drive one, one time up and down Baltimore Pike, just even, you know, a little bit of it towards the mall and you'll, you'll, while thinking about biking, you'll get a sense. That's definitely interesting because I know, um, because I'm more of like a runner kind of guy. I can play soccer and I sometimes go on mileage runs and just, you know, make four or five miles, pace myself and run as fast as I can in a comfortable pace, I would say. Mm. But like my one friend one time was like, oh, I need to run like 12 miles because he was like, he ran a, and I was just, he's like, I have a bike though. You can use my bike and we'll bike for the 12 miles, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, because I'm not about to run 12 miles with you. Mm. So I remember biking just to 12 miles and like going and stuff. And I'm like, after a while, I'm like, you really do feel like a nice burn like going. And we were on like a bike path, just flat bike path. Mm. But then I was like, imagining like going up hills, down hills, breaking up like in uphill biking is insane it's easier to run up a hill than bike up the hill because the wheels and the way it's moving just you just feel the burn a hundred percent yeah so credit to you man dude. Yeah, i did that in i did that in snow rain i literally i did it in every in all the weather mm-hmm. so there was no there was no weather that was like oh it's, it's, no i got up on a bike mm-hmm. i got down there that's that grit and that perseverance that like shapes you as an individual too for sure i definitely i was just determined Mm-hmm. I made a promise to myself to do something, and I didn't want to make an excuse. It, it, you know, nobody showed up. It could have been me by myself, or it could have been one person. It could have been a lot of people. I was going to show up, so I knew that was important. Mm-hmm. And making promises to yourself, they always say that, like, the more self-respect you have is, like, when you keep a promise to yourself. So it's like if I tell myself, yo, 9 a.m. I'll be at the gym, or 9 a.m. I'm going to be doing this, and I do it, then, boom, I kept a promise to myself. Boom. One plus one in accountability, plus one in self-respect. But then when you break your own promise, then you lose that, and then you lose your confidence. You lose your trust in yourself. So it's awesome that you kind of found a way to, like, stay, like, strong, like, and persevere to that decision for yourself and held yourself to that high level of accountability. Yeah, I appreciate that. It wasn't built overnight, but... Yeah, I I definitely didn't want to break a promise to myself. I just knew at the end of the day I got to look in the mirror. So, do you think that it requires a special type of individual to do those types of things, or that everyone has the potential to do that? I think everybody everybody has the potential to overcome their own obstacles. It's a decision whether you want to put the effort into overcoming it, mm-hmm. or how you even want to overcome it. What you see as overcoming something, you know. Uh, to some people, some things might not be a problem. It, they might not be, not by, not, may, may not be that ambitious. But I think we all have it in us if you choose to tap into it in some way for something. No, I love that. And it's interesting because even for me, I recently was talking with a couple of people about this. And it's understanding yourself. And once you understand yourself and the things that you do as an individual, you kind of can get to the next step. And people will say, like, oh, I want to be successful. Okay, but what's your definition of success? Mm-hmm. Is success having a lot of money? Is success having a family? Is success doing things that speak to your heart? And I tell people all the time, like, I laugh about this, and it's, oh, how did you know you wanted to do business stuff? How did you know you wanted to have a podcast? How did you know you wanted to be on YouTube and post videos? But then I look back on my own personal life and think, what was I doing all the time when I was younger? Talking to people, interrupting the class sometimes, always wanting to meet new people, super social butterfly. So then when I grow up and I don't don't do those things anymore and work behind a desk all day am I speaking to what the sound of my drum wants to make so it's kind of like finding that like thing that makes you do the thing you already like doing as an individual but then tying it into your career tying it into the style of family you want to have so I, I really like how kind of the stuff that you do and you've done kind of shaped you into this person but you didn't stray so far from who you are as an individual which I think is really cool yeah, I feel like when it came to the challenges I faced when I was younger, the lessons that were given to me shaped that a lot. So even when I say uh, health issues amongst family or even personal injuries that could have been life-threatening for me, you get a different air about life and death. Mm-hmm. And for me, you got your birth date, and you got your death date, and you got this dash in the middle, and it's, it's like, what you going to do with it? You know, there were times where I could have chilled, could have sat on the couch. It was whether it was snowing bad, raining, or I can just pedal, you know, get on my horse. And so I knew I wasn't. It would just be uncomfortable. That mm-hmm. was that was all. But you can't be afraid to be uncomfortable every once in a while. So doing that, just putting myself through different tests and trials, knowing that that's what that's what 
that's what you need to do to level up. That's what you need to become better. It's even like a it's like a video game. You know, early in the game it's easier to level up. You know, you do the basic stuff, but the challenges gotta increase and for you to get the larger amount of experience hmm. that's required. You know, there's bigger challenges that add up to leveling you up. You can't go back to the old challenges that you've been conquered and think you about to you know, you're just gonna be chipping away again. You you're not you got over that. You're going to face new challenges and, and new things that help you gain bigger, uh, more in-depth of experience. Mm-hmm. So I felt that. I saw that relation to myself. I love video games. So I just was like, Let me, I need to level up. I need to start putting in experience. I need to start doing things that's uncomfortable and hard. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. No, I love that answer, too, because it's funny because um, I always see those jokes and stuff on social media and stuff. People talk about it where it's like if you're in the right, then you're moving on the right path. You're going to find those NPCs. You're going to find the villains. You're going to find the boss character. And if you're fighting the boss character, you're going through the struggle. That means you're on the right path. So it's kind of resonance as well where you say that. It's like if you're not seeing villains, if you're not seeing obstacles, then what are you doing? you staying in the town. You have to go explore. What are some video games that you've liked playing growing up or just even play now? I've been a big fighting game person in Mortal Kombat. Mm-hmm. Big fan of the God of War series, Batman series. Mm-hmm. Uh I get busy. Just bought a Sega. Got NBA Jam again. You know, <laughs> I, I, I get busy. I think for me, one of the games I loved playing that kind of had that kind of vibe was uh, like the Assassin Creed games. Mm. And I always loved it because, like, you again, you started with what? Just like one little weapon. You, you start this. You go see all the viewpoints. And there's this. And there's this mission. And then, like, then you get to the next level of the new armor, the new weapon, the new this. And you kind of keep evolving and adapting, going to different, different cities that you needed to attend, different places. And it was so cool to kind of, like, even in a video game, like, People, you like the grind. It's like in a video game, it's so fun to like the grind, to get those experience points. But then your life is in and of itself getting those experience points, putting in the hours, putting in the time to like learn this skill, learn that skill, look at the viewpoints, see the world, meet this person, meet that person. So I love how even like who you are as an individual and in the games you play, you kind of also. Resonate. Well, I mean, is it is it that you let a grind or in a video game, you kind of see the reward at the end? <laughs> you know that you need to get your strength up to beat the boss. You know, you need an item. It's, it's something that, that you're chasing. It's not just let me level up my character for no purpose. Yeah. You know, so it got to come with purpose. It got to come with some something you're chasing. You know, if you cha- you, you're not running the run most of the time. You can do it. But there's a, usually a purpose, even if it's for fun. And then you train running so you can run faster uh, for whatever other purpose that it serves. To challenge somebody else this fast, you know, yeah. eventually. But it's 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 some purpose you're chasing. Mm-hmm. That's usually what keeps to, keeps you grinding. When it, when even because it gets hard, it gets tiring. That grind gets tiring. So, but what keeps you chasing it? You almost there. Oh, I got this many more experience points till I get this, or this much till I get this. You know. Mm-hmm. So I say you, you, it's more so the purpose and intent, whatever reward or what you're chasing. That keeps you keeps you grinding. It's, it's so interesting because even in life, you don't really see the reward sometimes, where you kind of are doing it, but like you know that there is a reward coming when you do the the proper things. But like in a video game, it's so outlined for you, where it's like you do this and this, you will literally get this item. This mm-hmm. is the quest that they give you, and you'll get this item. Mm-hmm. But in life, it's almost like you know you have to do this and this and this, but the item you want. You don't know whether or not you get it now, later, a week, a year, but you just keep having to do the same quest over and over again to get to this eventual goal. So I kind of, I think for me, it's interesting to kind of conceptualize that where like in a video game, it's so given to us, but in life, sometimes we don't know when the, it's going to be given to us. So that's a really cool point that you made. What's something in life that you feel like when you got to that point or like there's a test or a trial you've done over and over again. And so like waiting for that result, but like. How do you stay like constant with the consistency, knowing that you want this end goal or end result, but you feel like it's hard to envision it, maybe or hard to see it coming? That comes with sometimes thinking about you know when people say, "Oh, that's not possible, that's impossible," or even when that grit on not giving up. Like you got to keep your eye on the on the prize. You can't be unsure. You got to be sure. You got to be confident. You got to go after it. <laughs> uh, how you going to get it? You know when it when does it come? If you focus, if that's what you focused on, you know, it, you just know you're gonna get it. Whatever you're chasing, you can't focus on on that. You just know you're gonna get it. Uh, so yeah, that's that's where I would, that's where I would put that. It's funny too because in life, sometimes you know how when you're doing things, you're like, oh, I'm, 
I'm gonna get after it. Like, oh, I'm a hustler. I gotta make this to get this to get this. And you're all excited and passionate. But like, once that motivation kind of dies, right? We're like, you're motivated. You're so hungry, right? But then at some point, the motivation kind of dies. But like, in that little piece of like the abyss, right? Where you're like, dang, like, I don't feel motivated to do this today. But I know it needs to get done, like you said, with the accountability. So it's nice to see, like, like you said, the consistency was the hard part of calisthenics. The consistency and the accountability you had to yourself was the end goal. So it's nice to see that in like your life or in the way you describe things of self improvement and like you said, your passion about self improvement and self development that that has so far been like the overlying thing where it's like the constant and the consistency in oneself is will get you to that next step. So I really do like how you kind of that all tied in very nicely with everything that you do. Yeah, I mean. You got to, I think we was even talking earlier about, you know, when you talk to different people at networking events and how some people may not care what you do, mm-hmm. right? And they're going to give you the cold shoulder. And working through that, you know, you, 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 get, you can get offended, right? And you can learn that you don't always have to be offended. It don't have nothing to do with you. You just have to check the ego and understand that in your current position for what they're looking for, what they want you add no value, right? Not saying you have no value, but for them, you add no value because it don't fit with what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. They don't, for them, it doesn't hold any value. And that's okay because you then learn to weed those two type of people out too, the same mm-hmm. way they weed you out of the people that they want to talk to. Mm-hmm. They don't want to waste any time talking to our first two minutes. Oh, no, you're not somebody we want to talk to. Mm-hmm. So we're not even going to do this. I'm going to tell you, I don't take your car. We're not going to talk. I'm going to talk to this person over here that does have something that's piqued my interest because of what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So then you learn when you're talking to people, oh, this, y'all don't even, y'all don't do nothing with what I do. Why would I talk to you guys? Mm -hmm. You know, you learn to to trim the fat real quick. And again, it's a learning thing. It's not anything. It don't have to be personal. It's just because that's how you carry business. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, at a lot of these networking events, you know, sometimes you can go not looking for anything at all, just looking to talk to people, meet people. That's cool. Uh, then you find spaces for that. So you learn. No, I love that because even for me, like when I was like telling you about that, we were at that event together. It was interesting because I was going around talking to people, interacting, just, you know, being being my best self, doing what I do and find those people that are click link, click link. Oh, sweet. This person's buzzing with me. They were buzzing here. But again, when you meet those one or two people where. You have to make sure that who you're talking to, you change the way you talk because you want to make sure you're adapting and flowing with different types of people and what the different types of people want to hear and what they get inspired by. And it was interesting because when you said that, like it was, when I was telling you like the story about like me and that one guy who I felt like a little uncomfortable about when I was speaking to him. And like you said, don't not take it personal. You're just like, you know what? Maybe I'm beating to the sound of my drum and his drum is a whole different tune. So, okay, we don't have to, like, link or this or take it personal even. But you don't have to also chase that person's validation because then that's not someone who needs to be in your circle. So I think it's awesome to think, like, you got to just find your peoples and, like, just keep linking with them and keep growing that network with one another and finding those people that are in synchronization with you. So I really do appreciate that kind of that insight you gave. Yeah, you learn when it comes to this stuff. You, you Sometimes just going in, even with those type of people, like, looking to build a relationship, not necessarily – I want anything from you. Mm-hmm. You learn how to approach things that way. That way you can build a, somebody that doesn't necessarily have a direct way of wanting to help you or needing, you know, how can I help them? Or, and that's how you build a relationship and build your network because they may know other people. But, you know, once that you don't need to always look for something. For, you, you learn how to look to how can I give, how can I add value. Yeah. It, it, it changes the conversation, you know. No, absolutely. I love that. So what is something that most people don't know about you? Most people don't know I'm a hypnotist. They probably do. They're learning. You were telling me that people don't know that you have done stand-up comedy before. Yeah, I haven't shared that. But it's something I have done. It's something that I wanted to do to step out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. I think the the times I did it, the people enjoyed it, so it was good. <laughs> what what kind of inspired you to want to do that? Was it just like you like wanted to press your comfort zone? It was just like you wanted to see like, yo, am I funny or not? Uh, well, I don't even think I think that's what took the pressure off because I didn't care if I was funny. I do public, I do a lot of public speaking, and I feel like there's an art to everything. And learning how to incorporate that art form into my bag of tools and, and how I speak and approach speaking to people, I felt like that was that was a good way to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then break out of any other form of of mishaps that may come 
come across when when Pete speaking to the public. Mm-hmm. So. Was it more like I know like with stand up comedians, it's like some people have like sort of like obviously like the written jokes or like funny punchlines and events where like it leads up to it, or is it more like crowd work or was it more like storytelling different things? Mm, I think I was I'm more of a storyteller. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think I came up with good punchline jokes or anything like that. I wasn't good at that. I think it was more therapeutic. I got to talk about some things and just uh yeah. So that that was fun. And then I wasn't necessarily looking for the laughs, but Got a few, so it's cool. Mm-hmm. You know? well, or some stories that you would tell, like anything, just like life stories or what kind of stories you would tell? I mean, yeah, just some life stuff. Nothing crazy, you know. Uh, I think as I'm older, I was, I, so I was shot when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And I think at a certain point, I can learn to laugh about it and the things that I've dealt with going through recovering mentally or physically and, and the stuff that I go through with that. So, yeah. Stuff like that I get to talk about, so or I got to talk about, so mm-hmm. it's cool. And it's interesting because not everyone can kind of, A, laugh about those types of things or make jokes or, like, be fun about those things, but also not many people even go through and experience that intense. So it's, like, to have someone who can tell you that story and, like, make light of it is, like, a probably what kind of gave you that edge of, like, oh, I, c- I can do this. Like, I can share a story. I can do something that, share something that, about myself that most people might not have gone through in life. And that was dope. Was it, what was kind of like a story you would tell with that? Was it just kind of like casual or was it more like serious into like funny? Because uh, now, now you got me interested. Like now I want, I want to know. I mean, it wasn't, I don't think I'm super serious with anything. It's definitely very casual. Uh, I'm not, a, I don't think I'm do dark comedy or anything like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's very light. I, I just talk and tell and, and learn how to, how to speak better mm-hmm. about my story. How to, you know, it, it felt good being able to talk about it to a, to a more adult crowd and, cut loose and do those mm-hmm. type of things and i don't think it was anything i wanted to do seriously yeah but it was fun maybe i might get back to it maybe we'll see <laughs> just let me know i'll be there i'll For be in sure. the crowd so a question i always ask everyone like you know talk to these multifaceted people on the podcast is where do you kind of see the world going in five years and like what's like your future outlook for society and life it's a large question i mean <laughs> the whole world in five years mm-hmm. i i don't even it's crazy where we at now. Yeah. Let alone where could it be in five years for me? I don't think I necessarily dive in too much of global views too mm-hmm. often. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's not as much as I should. I hope there's a period of peace. Mm-hmm. You know, it sucks seeing certain things go on because of war and other stuff like that. So hopefully, in another five years, it, some things cool down. Mm-hmm. We can have we can have a time of peace. That would yeah. be cool. Yeah. No, I get that. I know you were telling me that you see like the world kind of becoming more spiritual because like you were kind of saying that you kind of noticed this trend of like the world kind of becoming a bit more spiritual. What kind of made you feel that way or what kind of things that you've seen in your life or in society that have given you that like feeling about it? I talk to a lot of people. Uh, I hear what they got to say. It's more outspoken, more accepted. You see things that are sold. There's a market for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why I see it that way. People are more open. Mm-hmm. about it you know so that's that's what i that's how, how the conclusion i came to for me i've noticed that more and more people for example are like converting to islam but why are they converting to islam it's like oh because they see what's going on around the world and they're like wait so why are people doing this why are people this religion why? it's like because now we have this age of information where like google is you can search up any question you want on the internet and get it boom like that so people can ask questions constantly to the world to society to the internet even and get maybe an answer so i think it's like when you have this abundance of information and quickness of learning and trying to find something new about life, you can find it. So even seeing that, it's like, oh, maybe that's why people are like asking more questions now, like you were saying. Yeah, I mean, it comes with growth. Like I said, it's gonna you're gonna find what resonates with you. <laughs> even over time, your views may change. <laughs> and you had a right to do that. You got a right to outgrow some, grow with it. Mm-hmm. So if you feel like something's missing and you're looking for a way to create a platform to find it mm-hmm. you're gonna look for something and you're gonna find what resonates within you so mm-hmm. yeah that's how that's how i would see that yeah and i just see a lot of when you more open-minded i see people it taking people to different places that, yeah. that they find their happiness in and it's funny you're saying like where the world is going five years like where are we at now like it's right now is crazy right so it's like what are some things even now in society that you've noticed just like your day to day, we were like, you know, five years ago, like ten years ago, like damn, like we're 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 accelerating in this crazy society now. Like, what are some things like you've noticed just in your day to day? I mean, everything, you know, we the technology, everything you're using to record this podcast, <laughs> like everything is 
it's always something new and crazy. Mm-hmm. It's always something with how we move in. It's like, wow, we're moving fast. So I don't think it's for five years, I don't think it's any shocker. I think you got to look back to when you were growing up and be like, oh, this is dramatic. You know, like VHS is to where we are now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, we're loading them up, throw them in the day. <laughs> yeah, rewinding them, all that. So it's, I don't look back five years and be like, oh, that's crazy. I just know it's it's kind of expected now. Yeah, like advancement of society is yeah. going to move forward no matter what we do. What yeah, we think. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think anything shocked me. I was wondering what you thought, even if just recently. I remember like uh, looking at like different things about like, oh, science says this or this body says this, and I know you've obviously seen like all like the AI models. Now AI is such a big buzzword in all this life in society. And I was speaking with someone, and they were like, you know what? At the end of the day, all these technologies and AIs can come, but there's no AI or something that's going to get me to go to the gym and work out and keep my body healthy. So that's why I'm going to lock in and focus on those types of things. So I kind of saw that. So what do you think about that kind of? I mean, yeah, no, no AI can work you out. So, (laughs) I mean, they got all types of shortcuts, but I just, when you, when you do certain things and work to overcome that, like you said, your self-respect go up and a lot of other things come with it. So no (laughs) shortcuts, AI can't do it. So I think I'm pretty safe right now. Yeah, no, exactly. I love that. So what is an unpopular opinion that you might have? unpopular opinion people most people know that they talk to me i know i don't like crossfit so that might that's unpopular (laughs) yeah i think it's inferior to traditional calisthenics so can you explain to me a little bit about why you feel that way uh i feel like a lot of things don't have a lot of foundation into how it's approached i personally see a lot of people get hurt because of that it's it's just not as it's not even as pretty Mm -hmm. somebody doing the the kip muscle up or pull up that they do we in calisthenics you learn how to do things a lot more functionally and it looks smoother cleaner Mm -hmm. more controlled so yeah that's my that's my personal beef (laughs) with with something you know a movement but yeah it's not like i'm attacking it personally or every day like what's an example movement in a crossfit community versus because obviously calisthenics like you said like the functionality part where it's like the pull-ups sit-ups moving doing all these different things like pike push-ups for example is like Mm. a calisthenics thing but is crossfit the one where like they're like throwing themselves around on the bar or is no that's oh you said you know crossfit's like when they're like doing the different series of workouts Mm -hmm. the, the dumbbell throws and then they're Swinging on the bar for the pull-ups. Yeah. Those, those I, I really don't get. The, the walking handstands, races, mm-hmm. all, all that stuff. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all that stuff. The big CrossFit gyms you see with all the... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think there's a higher risk of injury in those types of gyms as well? or? I mean, in, in a lot of the movements as you get older, doing those things probably is higher risk. The approach, the more methodical, basic, foundational approach of calisthenics, sure. Interesting. And what are some like the like? I know recently I remember seeing something you were training with like an you know, older gentleman for like calisthenics, like well, over seventy years old. So it's like cool to see like even in like older age, like you can still be active and do calisthenics and be able to use your body weight for your own strength. So what's something that's kind of like what is a, like a thing that inspires you when you see that kind of activity with someone who's like again like an older gentleman doing it at age of seventy? Uh, that's what I saw, saw my grandpa doing. So mm-hmm. my belief is you should grow old and strong, mm-hmm. old and wise. Mm-hmm. And like, older people. Yeah, I love that. And it's interesting too because nowadays like people think that when you get older it's like, Oh, that's it, man, I'm I'm old, I'm washed. But I always tell people like, No, I don't say that. Like, yeah, it might take you a little longer to recover, but you don't have to have that mindset where you're like, Oh, I'm getting older, so I'm I'm forced to slow down or I'm forced to not work hard. No. Nah, it's gotta keep moving. Mm-hmm. That's basically it. You gotta keep moving. Active that way you don't have your body just knows to stay on top of things. Yeah, something that I've always loved about even like noticing when i see like an older gentleman playing soccer like at the park they're playing here or they'll do pick up soccer and then there's a 60 year old playing with us with a 50 year old but then they're competing with the 18 year olds but they're the ones going even harder than the 18 year olds and they're yelling and screaming and they want them to go harder like if when i was your age i was running way harder work harder kid and i love seeing that because in our culture and society it's like we think that like Oh, like you get older, like the passion dies. But no, the, the passion never dies. Like you said, you grow old and wise. Like you don't just, you shouldn't like limit yourself when you have that passion that's always going to last. Mm-hmm. So I love that. Like that kind of is like a thing that you kind of promote and like love having in your lifestyle as well. I always ask this question to all like my guests and I say, what is a word you want to learn in Arabic? And the word you said was hi. But it's awesome because hi, like if you just translate it just directly, it's salam, right? But like obviously everyone knows like salamu alaikum. It's like salam alaikum is like, saying hello but it's like peace and blessings too like, you know it's like 
it's the best greeting as well. Like in our culture, it's known as the best greeting. So when you said that, I was like, oh, it's awesome. He wants to learn salam. Salam. Salam alaikum. Salam. Yeah, that's exactly. And that's like how we respond. It's awesome because they say that's the best thing they say to people. Just saying hello. Mm. And it's interesting because how often do we just walk up to people and say hello? You know? Yeah, right, 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 right. So it's awesome that kind of, that was like the word you chose. And it kind of is very fitting with like the kind of person you are too, where it's like community building. So I kind of like laughed and I saw that you wrote that word down. Word, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so I want to end with your favorite quote. So I would love for you to kind of talk about your favorite quote. Life's good if you don't weaken. Life's good if you don't weaken. Can you elaborate? We started off the, the conversation about overcoming obstacles and challenges. And they're going to be there, you know. So if you don't succumb to those pressures and and keep fighting and don't allow yourself to feel weak or defeated, life's always going to be good. I love that. And it's cool because in my life I've noticed even where I feel kind of down, I feel kind of unmotivated. But if I have that mission, like you said, that purpose, you have a reason for doing things. You're like, all right, but that's the reason why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this for my own ego or my own success or for money or for this, but I'm doing it because there's a reason, there's a purpose and mission behind it. So the more you strengthen that, the more you don't dive into the weakness, the more confident you are, the more happy you are with who you are as an individual. Mm-hmm. So it's awesome too. Like I love like how like that quote even resonates as well with like the person as an individual you are as well. So it's awesome, man. Appreciate that. No, of course. And I look forward to seeing you again in Philly and stuff. And maybe one of these days I'll get a uh, Cal Stennis workout going on with for you. For sure. I appreciate you having me on here, man. No, of course. So thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode of the Oli Canoli Show. Again, today we had Evan Harden. And it's really interesting because calisthenics is a way of life to him. It's not a way of, oh, I want to have big arms and muscles, but having functionality and passion behind improving your mobility and your long life and health. So thank you guys again for tuning in to another episode. And I'll see you guys next week. See you later.